Hey, I'm Cameron. And I'm Will. And this is Shoot First Questions Later, an informative and mildly entertaining photography podcast with a raw Aussie flavour. And Will, we're going to answer some questions later, but first, let's talk about what you've been up to this week. What have you taken photos of? Okay, Cam. Uh, Nothing too wild this week, mate. Just local at home and kind of heading out uh, a couple of mornings the past week in the hopes of uh, seeing something interesting in the sky. You got a crack of sunrise, didn't you? Yes. One of the best I've seen in a while, actually. It was really just a nice, fiery sky, which has been a pleasant, uh, a welcome sight after at least two weeks of pretty flat light, either clear skies or just grey um, blocked horizons. So I uh, grabbed Judah, my son, who kind of heard me trying to sneak out the door uh, as I was heading out to this sunrise. So I said, all right, quick, man, we, if you're going to come with me, we're going to keep this thing moving because the sky is doing something special. As you know, my routine is to wake up a good hour, uh, an hour and 15 before the sunrise just to check out the conditions at hand so I could... I saw something happening and, yeah, my son joined me. We just headed down to uh, the quarry, Bombo Quarry, a pretty uh, famous seascape location here in Australia, in the world, actually. It's world class, in my opinion. That's the terms I use, world class, world seascape class. location. Get your hopes up. And, yeah, man, it was just insane. It was a nice – it's a good place to photograph the power of the ocean as it kind of crashes against these big basalt columns, these cliffs mm. and – I've been photographing it for years, and I thought I was happy with the photos I'd shot there. Um, but yeah, I've got a I've got a new favourite from this location. And ever the artist, you're never happy with the last <laughs> one. Stay hungry, son. <laughs> it was just nice to have my. It was actually have my son with me as well. And man, yeah, what a yeah. moment! It was just crazy. And yeah, to look at the photo that I captured, and. and then look at the previous ones and go, oh wow, it's funny how just in I reckon I think. The last time I shot there was close to 12 months ago and I thought that was me kind of finished there and I was pretty content with where I'd, how I'd uh, progressed in my photography over the, the five years or so. So, um, yeah, to look at what I've captured now and go, man, that's better than all the other stuff and the other stuff looks embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about the photo. Um, you can see it in the show notes yeah, or we'll at Shoot notes. First Podcast on Instagram. Yeah. Um, let's, your composition here, I, I think it's pretty new to me, like from what your last yeah, ones okay. that you've yeah, shot. Yeah, definitely for myself. And it's a tricky thing to do a Bombo. I, I've tried to get some foreground in where, where I've shot that from, as you can see, if you see in the photo, the ocean, it's very dangerous. Like it, it rushes up there and it's, it's really difficult to still get rocks in your foreground with the waves breaking over because by that point you're generally getting saturated or, you know, high, running for your life essentially. Um, but yeah, I was really determined to try and just capture that. For me, this location, it's about that power and the relationship between ocean and earth. And it was just trying to harness that, get it in a single photo. Such a challenge, mm. but um, were you in harm's way there? Because you're pretty close to the water. It uh, looks, yeah, like no, I wouldn't say harm's way, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure if someone was a bystander, they probably thought I was an absolute idiot. But <laughs> you know what it's like once you're in the zone. Yeah, and I was safe. I was always safe. Yeah. Safe enough. And <laughs> and you had that fiery red sky, and to me that. Um, is another element that shows off how powerful that whole location is. Yeah, like, you need that it's really got a bit fiery... Of a pre, it's got epic. a primordial feel to yeah, that location. Like it's been there just forever. And, yeah. Well, you know, it, the basalt columns, it's actually lava. It's cooled down lava. So, you, yeah. there's this real sense of prehistory there. And, yeah, having that fiery sky just kind of makes you feel like you're yeah. out, out of this current... <laughs> yeah current time and place so yeah f man just to get all the elements combined feels good it's nice feels like a rewarding thing mm. as you know most people probably know um all creatives really it's um i'm never really very con overly content with my work so it's uh, whenever i get something that i'm proud of or happy with it's it's quite an elated feeling that lasts a brief amount of time. Yeah, and yeah, no, it's good. And you're happy now until uh, six months' time. Yeah, when exactly. You're... When I look and laugh at this yeah. one and try again, <laughs> but that's what it's all about. And I mentioned about seeing the progress. 
And uh, that's a good thing. If you can look back at photos from six months to 12 months ago and obviously beyond and, you know, not really like them that much or, you know, think that think you can improve. improve yeah. yeah, I think, I believe that's a good thing because it, it will keep you ever growing and yeah. uh, whatnot. So, uh, yeah, no, it's good. That was a, just, like I said, just a fun morning. I was just so happy and I actually, uh, I specifically, re- I, was, I was thinking about this today. I'm, you know me, I get, when it, when it's all happening like that, I get pretty wild and loud <laughs> and all sorts of things and yelling and yahooing. And yeah, I actually remember saying out loud, like just looking back at my son, like, look, you know, and he, he kind of just, I think he just does it to please me, but he's like, wow, you know, saying it back. And I, at one point I was like, yo, like just yelling out. <laughs> And um, he he did it as well. He was like, oh. <laughs> so we both like just howling away Shoot, on the rocks, and boy. yeah, it just made me super happy. Happy oh, thinking about that's it. Good that's times. what it's all about, man. Just yeah. making the memories, really. Yeah, it was good. Oh, what about good. you, buddy? Well, yeah, been getting the camera out. Yeah, I uh, I've only got the digital out a couple times in the last week, but I've had the the film, the film that we film, the film camera that we mentioned on the last episode. And admittedly, I think we need to clarify that. We did plan, we mentioned in the last episode, to get out for yeah. a shoot, which has not happened yet. Yeah. For the both the of us with the film Conditions camera. didn't really align. Did yeah. It? But I'm being a bit picky here of conditions and things like that. But we don't want to waste the film kind of thing. Well, yeah. that's it. You've got to pay every push of that shutter's yeah. money. So we want to make every every cent count. Yeah. But you have gotten out a little bit with it. To be honest, I can't remember what half of them are, but... There were a couple. The beauty of film. Yeah, there were a couple from uh, Bombo one afternoon uh, in the past week. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the the sun was setting. Uh, it was before the sun was below the horizon, so it was kind of beaming into uh, some of the taller uh, columns down there. Yeah. And it was uh, really lighting up the columns, and the sky behind it was uh, dark and cloudy. So. Hopefully, I get some nice sort of separation between... It's such a different uh, thing, shooting film, not yeah. knowing. and yeah, it's, kind, it's kind of exciting, I guess, like yeah. to have that anticipation and yeah. it's either going to be a good moment or a, a sad one when you yeah. get the roll back. But yeah, that's cool. For sure. Such but, a foreign concept to me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to finally having a go. Yeah, but f- I'll, I will mention for anyone uh, who's familiar with film, I was uh, using uh, Try tri x kodak tri x film and um yeah now we've got some kodak portra 160 lined up for when will and i head out and uh take some color so we probably won't have these on the show notes we're not your film ones at least yeah just we'll have to wait a little bit yeah (laughs) build the hype (laughs) but yeah i've i've took a couple uh digital ones here and there as well Um, cool how's the film do you feel like having this film camera that you've uh, borrowed from matt godkin uh <clears throat> Has it kind of reignited a little bit of enthusiasm in you? Yeah, a little bit to just yeah. get out there and it is. It's like I think maybe if I could um, have that instant maybe if you could turn feedback. Turn. <laughs> turn. <laughs> um, if because I love this camera, I love the photos that it takes that I've seen other people take, sort of thing, and I, I love what it does uh, with the depth and the depth of field and. So I'm excited to see the results, but it is so different just not having that instant feedback. Yeah. You just, like, that would really drive me to pick it up. Sort I'm going to you know say I mean, it, in this day and age, in Ken, this day and in age, this day and age man, of Wilbur. instant gratification, <laughs> <laughs> back in my day, you had to work hard for your uh, yeah. rewards, mate. No, it's, it, yeah, I do it's like gonna it. It's going to teach you a lesson in patience, perseverance. <laughs> And we'll slip another word in there later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was trying to take this photo uh, and on a tripod, except I didn't have a tripod, so I was leaning it on a stool. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and usually on a digital camera, like on my Fuji, I can hook it up with my phone. So, like, if I need to be in front of the lens, which I was in this case... Um, I could, like, look at my phone to see what the composition oh, okay. looks like yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Or I could have, you know, like, take a photo, run back and check, check it. Check it. Yeah, but, yeah, dude. Yeah, so this, <laughs> it was so much harder. Brutal, man. So, yeah, I was just, like, peering through the viewfinder, like, thinking, yeah, I think that's The rewards right. are like, so much higher, aren't yeah, they? If so, you get it. Yeah. You just... Uh, it's, I can imagine. It's a real mug game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, pun city. 
<laughs> I can imagine the frustration, um, but yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. I think it did. It, to answer your question, I think it has ignited a bit more mm. passion in me. And yeah, at at this stage, I I've been sort of taking photos every day again. So Sweet. it's always a good sign. There so. we go. Light it up. Yeah, passion's burning away. Yeah, for sure. Just trying to mix things up and keep First that world passion problems, alive. Yeah. Digital versus analog. <laughs> that's good, man. Sweet. Good to hear. Yeah, uh, so, so we're going to roll on to uh, our question now from our, our listener. And what do we sure. have, Cam- Campster? We've got a question from Floyd. And F- Floyd has an Instagram if you want to check it out. It's at Floyd, F L O Y D dot Mallon, M A L L O N. Apologies if I've pronounced that incorrectly, Floyd. And uh, he's asked, when editing photos, how much would you say is too much? Obviously, the amount of editing deemed acceptable depends on the genre of photography. But at what point do you think an image becomes over-edited? Uh, so, this is a this is a question, a bit of a balancing act in editing where you see it a lot. You see some photos that can become really uh, over-edited. And I like your word for it, Will, when you, when someone's kind of taken things a bit too my, far. My term, yeah. overcooked it. Overcooked it, yeah. So we, <laughs> You know what I mean. There. Weirdly, we have like cooking references. So marinating is yeah, when you leave, you leave a yeah. photo to we, sit for a while. We could probably while. touch on marinating. Yeah. yeah, we might get into that. Yeah, shortly. okay. And yeah, overcooked. So so that's like taking it too far. Mm. And uh, So how do we answer it? Well, you don't, but you don't want to not right. edit. Hey, like you, you need to do those touches. In well, our opinion, that well, let's let's take a step back, mate. All right, All right. Um, I think there's a misconception uh, with digital photography and the, the word editing or processing or Photoshop. I feel like the general public, once you mention anything like that, it's like a sudden roadblock. Like, oh, oh, your photos are edited. Yeah. That, oh, you, which more or less they... You're a liar. <laughs> yeah, you're a liar. What I'm looking at is completely fictional and this is a fabricated scene. What and It's kind of a bit of a segue here from the film, what we're just talking about. With digital photography, if you shoot in a in a raw file, which is the highest resolution that, you know, a digital camera can do, the file that it produces instead of a JPEG, which is a compressed file... Uh, digital cameras have the ability to shoot in yeah what's called a raw file. These raw files are somewhat like film in the sense that they need to be developed. Uh, the 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 photo that you see on the back of the camera, it's just like a little JPEG uh, preview. But the raw the raw file which I shoot in, you shoot in like let's what say seventy percent of probably most photographers do as a wild random guess. I'd tell you, probably the majority of professionals would at least. Uh, these raw files are very stripped back. They live up to that term raw. They, they lack contrast, saturation. They're quite flat. And uh, they pretty much have to be mm. edited in some way just to at least getting it look like how it looks on the back of the camera when you took the photo. Yep. Um, a raw file would rarely look like how your eyes saw oh, a scene. It would be... Pretty much impossible. You could yep. maybe make a JPEG look like that by adjusting settings, settings in the in camera, camera, white yep. balance and saturation, blah, blah, blah. But the raw file, yeah, it has to be tampered with to some degree. So that's the first part out of the way. So, you know, if anyone... I kind of start there. If someone questions, oh, do you use Photoshop? Then I say, well, I actually have to. I can't... You can't put a raw file into an everyday computer and throw it on your phone and upload it to social media. You just can't do that. When it comes to the editing of the photo, sorry for hijacking the question too, I'll just say this part. Um, It's just subjective, like a lot of things. And there's definitely, Floyd's mentioned about certain genres and things like that. But even within genres, it's just subjective about what one person would deem a good edit or an acceptable edit or an over edit. And then, you know, what the next person think is... uh, completely ridiculous everyone's just going to have their own opinion there um so obviously for this we'll answer i'll answer what i think yeah to what you think yeah but, um, we'll yeah, sort it's, of i feel like this do. is this is there's not an objective once you approach 35 on the saturation slider you've uh, pushed the, <laughs> you've overcooked things but yeah it's this is a kind of a, a territory where there's going to be no right or wrong but we can just give our feedback and yeah that's why. all we can do really just... that's all i can do mate all right <laughs> floyd <laughs> 
<laughs> so we'll try. So, all right, Cam, what, what's your kind of instinct here for this mm. question? What's the first thing that pops into mind for you for an answer for this? Yeah. An over-edit. And you and me over... have different photography styles. You and I have shot the same locations with the similar cameras and t- similar shots, but then they look quite, not. I wouldn't say vastly different, but we just edit differently. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So where, where do you stand with yeah. over-editing? I kind of um, have had a bit of the a bit of a taste of the full spectrum in a way. Like on one side, there's my landscape photos, which I do sort of aim to get to as close as my vision, which I felt when I was at the location. Mm. So so when I'm photographing something like Mount Cook in New Zealand, uh, I kind of see, I have this vision when I'm there of how the place makes me feel. So I, maybe I want to convert it to black and white or maybe I want to keep it... Um, you know, in color, but it still stays true to to what I've seen and the conditions that I've had. I'm not going to drop in a photoshopped sky of like a fiery red sunset when I was there and it was blue sky. I'm, you know, I'm just going to sort of work in that way. Um, and I, yeah, I try to keep. You mean people actually? Do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll get into that shortly. Yeah. I think, but yeah. Um, so that's for landscapes. It's kind of. I want to portray how I'm viewing this scene, but not in a strict way where it's exactly what my eyes are seeing, but how my what vision I've created of this scene in my head while I'm there. But mm. then on the other side of things, I've done really conceptual photos with a lot of Photoshop where I, I have. I've photoshopped a sky into a, behind a wave and I've put people running on top of it. And, yeah, which is one of your yeah. uh, most viewed and... I, yeah, most so, popular for lack of a better term. Yeah. Popular photos ever made. Mm. That that crazy conceptual piece. Yeah, and I was so really transparent about that being mm. photoshopped. Like it uh, with like no, which one, is yeah. <laughs> no one's trying to <laughs> I'm, I guarantee yeah. you there's probably someone <laughs> I so there were a couple comments. You gotta be this, quick to run up those waves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the point being uh there's a place a for there's a place actually. for one. There's Run a up place. A wave. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I'm just envisioning like a good YouTube search there, like wave running, just trying to run. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, there's a time and place for different things. And yeah, and each warrants its own style. And yeah, so I think over editing in like a landscape sort of thing is yeah, you're just like smashing the clarity. Everything's way too contrasty, or maybe you've pumped up the shadows too much, and the dynamic range is just looks like a Looks like Chernobyl, like a nuclear bomb has just gone <laughs> off in your photo. And th- to me, that's when things are too far. E- even sharpening, like I can tell when a photo mm. has been sharpened too much and it, it just like stabs my eyeballs. The edges, yeah. Yeah, and, and... I think what you're saying now somewhat summarises my answer in the fact that if I was going to keep this answer short and sweet, it would be if I look at a photo and within the first two to three seconds, my... F- one of my first thought is over edited or overcooked or oh that doesn't look right. That's when I know something's been or feel like it's been overdone. Yeah. And that obviously can be a range of things. You've just ticked a few there. Definitely over sharpened, over saturated's a big one when you can just mm. tell color it looks like a cartoon when colours are just enhanced a bit too much. There's sometimes just these dead giveaways where you just Instantly, like I said, that it's like a first thought, like, ooh, that, that's jumping out at me in a negative way. I feel like that's just subconscious that can happen as well. You're not even really – just goes bang, and then you analyse it and go, yeah, this is why I don't really like the look of it. Yeah. Um, and then what's, what's funny, though, is there could be photos where it's probably been technically edited further or even longer, but it has a more natural look. Yeah, so – and sometimes I struggle with that in the sense that I'll have a photo that may have taken a good couple of hours to process, but it actually is staying way truer to reality. Mm. But it was just this interesting or dynamic light that was quite difficult to capture and yeah. and make it look realistic. Let's <laughs> let's go into this a bit because I know oh, we, the rabbit we hole. Both, We're yeah, getting deep here. Down the, we <laughs> both have a photo that, uh, that we've taken. We were next to each other it, we were in iceland and um and it's probably for both of us one of our more extensively processed shots i'll put the photo in the in the show notes as well i'm but curious to know which photo it is oh come on it's iceland the aurora uh um, no, kirkyfell yeah so okay yeah yeah we 
Yeah, but you we were both had this. <laughs> <laughs> we both had this setup, and we knew that the conditions that we were shooting in it was night time, but there was uh, the aurora borealis above us, the northern lights, and and we had a running water stream in front of us. So, so we wanted basically different elements to line up in a photo that you can't get in a single exposure in night time. So at night time, so. We, yeah. I think mine and my photo was this ended up being about six shots, yeah, 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 all put into one photo. But it, it took those six photos to make what I saw a reality. Yeah, because one photo could not have translated that scene as no. I saw it at all. Because the entire yeah, you can hopefully you guys have can check the photo out or might have an idea of what we're talking about, but. To get this scene, just because it's night time, that's the main issue here. It was just so dark. We're basically in a little trench, like a valley, running water, and then this valley leads to a huge mountain, Kirkufell, and then the northern lights above it. And basically, this is the, where I would use the terminology. We had the limitations of the camera. There was no way that you could just push the button in one exposure and capture what we were looking at. It just wasn't going to happen, and... Yeah, you said you used about seven photos. I'd probably, I think I might have had about five, and that was purely to get the depth of field, keep the noise really low. Um, so doing a, what we'd call a focus stack technique, um, an exposure blend, so longer exposures for the entire foreground to keep the noise lower, and then a, a faster shot for the aurora so it doesn't blur. You don't want to lose all the details in the northern lights, um, and then a. I also, and I think you did as well, a focal length blend. So yep. then yep. zooming in and shooting the mountain a little bit tighter because we used a wide angle for the entire foreground, which showed those foreground details good. But then the, the pin cushion effect squishes down the large mountain that you're looking at, which is towering above you and it's taking Defeats up... the purpose. Yeah. Like, that's so, what you're there to photograph. So you have so. to like zoom in and shoot that a little bit tighter and then, yeah, blend it all together that was definitely for me probably the biggest mm. job I've had and I sat on that photo for over a month mm. marinating <clears throat> and that's the marinating process that's what we we're talking about friends you you know you add the flavor and then you just got to let it soak it up before you put it out there to the yep. world make sure you're happy with the work and I remember yeah letting it marinate and I'll just keep looking at it over and over if something jumped out of me and this is what I was talking about earlier if I'd look at it and think oh that just looks weird or inaccurate I'd fix it and tweak mm. it because I wanted it to look real to how I saw it. And ironically, it took a month of uh, sitting there processing and working my hours mm. and blending multiple shots together. Yep. So that's the other extreme. Um, but yeah, I guess I draw the line though in the sense that I, if I have to take multiple photos to capture a, a literal moment in time just so I, you know it's looked like how I saw and experienced and to achieve the right detail and everything, then I'll happily do that. Uh, but I, what I won't do is what's called a composite image in the sense that I might photograph a waterfall or whatever, a foreground from one day, and then I'll get a sky shot from a previous day or whatever and then place it in, so, yeah. or a Milky Way or I whatever agree. it is. Yeah. And I guess my little hang-up with editing and processing, and I feel like this does kind of give Photoshop a bad name or just the word editing in general is when people will do a composite image and they won't clarify that it's fake and they try yep. and get away with it to make people think that they got these insane conditions at a certain location and and then it eventually becomes known or obvious that it was manipulated and it kind of just paints all landscape photographers or just photography in general with that same brush of, okay, if you edit a photo, then how can we trust? I feel yeah. like there's a level of, of trust with photography, like an unwritten code that, and this is because for so many decades, a, a photo was a literal moment in in time. There wasn't the technology. Of course, in the film days, they could do certain things, dodge and burn, but generally a photo that you saw was portrayed as reality because it had to be. That's all there was. And now we live in... <clears throat> an era where anything's possible and I feel like that unwritten code is still existent but no one had really openly adheres to it or obviously there's you don't have to and it just gets a bit blur a bit messed up sometimes yeah. um so 
Yeah, there's all these different extremes. For me, I just personally love when I can point my camera, bang, get the photo in one shot, look at it on the back of the camera and see the result. And that's what I'm always striving for. I'm always striving for getting the shot right in camera and that's it. But inevitably, there are scenarios where it's just not possible. For me personally, I'd probably say that's maybe 20 to 30% of the time where I might have to do a focus stack or blend exposures because the dynamic range is too big. So I'll do two quick shots, one after the other, and have to blend those two to get the entire range of light, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, always just going for that that single shot. I think that's just most rewarding for me personally. But as I mentioned, you know, if someone has to do or has the desire to do something completely different... I can't really, um, you know, can't judge them on that. Yep. And I see some awesome composite pieces and things like that, and it's very inspiring. Um, but when it comes to the whole when is something over-edited, I think just to keep that direct part of the answer short and sweet, it's when my eyes and my brain just are not pleased with what it's look, what I'm looking at. So when yep. I look at a piece and my first thought is, mm, it looks a bit overdone or overcooked, mm. then that's... That's, I guess, when I feel like it's overdone. And every single photo is just going to be different depending. And as I said, ironically, I could be looking at something that probably wasn't even that edited and think that's overdone. Or there could be something that sat there and was edited for weeks. And I look at it and think, man, that looks so nice and natural. And that's a whole new skill set in itself. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree with that. Uh, whole sort of outlook on on when it's over edited. And you, you, I, I think this is sorry, man. Just no, very right. quickly, the the marinating process that we kind of joked about and spoke of. I really encourage anyone to just try this. Yeah, marinate your work and let it simmer for a little while. Let it sit in the fridge. Sorry, because <laughs> you will look at it differently if you just do an edit and then throw it up online straight away, you'll look at it later in a different light and you might change your opinion about the photo. So if you let something marinate, when you open it back up later, you'll probably make a change. It may be minor or maybe something quite big, but I feel like that way you're really just fine-tuning your work and making sure you put the best out there and that's going to help you prevent having that over-edited look or you know getting around that type of problem. Yeah, for sure. I I might just add go easy on the clarity slider, go easy on the sharpening yeah. and the saturation and you'll be fine. Like Yeah, they're the main giveaways, aren't they? Clarity, saturation, sharpness. Sometimes you'll play with those sliders and in in that moment you'll think, Yeah, it looks fine and it then you leave it for it could even just be ten minutes and then you look away from the computer for ten yeah. minutes, come back and that's and still it's a like, marinade. Whoa, yeah. That's a quick marinade. Yeah. So you, you could be in a bright room with lots of sunshine, so everything just isn't popping as much and then later on you look at it when the lights yeah. are out and you're like, What the heck was that? That's another <laughs> good thing. Just like dark like try to look at your photo on different screens as well. Yeah. Get into a dark like on I, your I shut the laptop. blinds now yeah. when I edit and just kind of... I don't make it pitch black, but I just mm. find having it dim Darker, so you can yeah. see properly. And the screen as well, try not to view it on like a white background. Like have your photo on a black yeah, background that, that and that that sort of context helps a bit. Anyway, yeah, let's... Thanks for that question, yeah, Floyd. Open up the can of worms, Yeah, <laughs> That's a good one though. Thanks, dude. And um, if you want to send in your own questions, you can send them to shootfirstpodcast at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, now we're going to talk a little bit about our, our next topic, which we're going to go back to, uh, make them or break them a little bit of a rule that we thought of and, uh, a rule that we're going to explain how to adhere to it and why it's good. And then obviously, and um, then we're going to s- smash it out of the park yeah, and show you why you don't have to adhere to it. At yeah, times. for sure. And, and this week, uh, this one we imagine uh, would apply maybe particularly to new newer photographers who are uh, who who pick up a camera and they might start taking photos of of a particular subject and then and then they feel like they uh they have to stick to a genre or they want to you know start going into this genre or a style yeah a style or a look yeah and you and you sort of start to to focus on uh, photographing this one thing which. Uh, you've you you've pretty much been doing landscapes mm. from the start, Will. So you can you can speak to the positives of that, can't you? Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I just picked up a camera and it was just a natural inclination to photograph landscapes. I, I didn't even cross my mind to try anything else because I just had no desire to do that. And I guess everything then that I looked at for inspiration and everything I sought to do, everything I even learned and adapted with my photography was all based around landscape photography. So when I'm looking at settings and, uh, you know, learning different techniques, it all was in, within the bubble of landscape photography, mm. which for me, that's worked out great, obviously. Like I'm in a good place now. But <clears throat> eventually down the line, I would obviously dabble in doing a few other things, even just say photographing family or whatever. And that's a completely different ball game. And I guess what we're kind of just getting at with this uh, rule essentially is that if you limit yourself to having... This is obviously, as we said, when you first get into photography, it's very tempting to go down a road of this is what I want to do and that's it and just sticking to it and then condemning everything else but yeah i feel like you get tunnel you can have a tunnel vision then that can close you out from other creative possibilities and i think there's so many other benefits in having a go at a little bit of everything and trying it all being open to different styles genres looks etc because it's only going to strengthen your entire skill set i think yeah, and give you a better night and uh, be an all-round better photographer. Before then, eventually you might maybe go down the road of uh, tr- trying a specific style only or whatever mm. it is. Yeah. So when you do uh, begin to focus on one particular style, uh, a, a certain style will have its own um, its own conventions. So things that are common in that style are. Uh, an example might be portraits is shoot with a shallow depth of field, like, you know, shoot a, shoot a 51.4. Or another convention might be um, landscapes, uh, you know, get close to your foreground and shoot at F16. So that's like a, yeah, that's a something, or something, yeah, like that. that's something typical of, of a genre. Uh, and maybe you've also dived into this style because uh, it's convenient for you and you know it's nearby or you can work it around uh your daily life in some way or another and so these these things might sort of be sort of be these uh influences influences on how you begin to photograph and when you begin to get limited by um you know what's what happens in this style uh technically or how convenient it is these things will just that they just sort of add up and keep you in this in this tunnel that you spoke about where uh it's hard to see outside of the tunnel it's hard to explore and you can kind of hit a plateau i guess where you mm. you you just kind of reach a point where you're just sailing along then yeah um you know you might dabble in it for a while you've got into it yeah this is what i want to do this is you know i live close to this location so i'll shoot this style go down that road and who knows you could be the world's best portrait photographer but all you're Mm. worried about doing is shooting um you know landscapes for example so we're gonna like talk about breaking out of this tunnel really but just a quick detour uh we want to thank our sponsors (laughs) colgate toothpaste (laughs) so yeah a little detour here i want to talk about how will you a uh, predominantly landscape photographer, but your influences don't really come that much from landscape photography. So, mm. you, t- to me, this is an example of how you have this uh, style that you love and you still take this artistic mm. influence from other genres. So, it's it's kind of like your, your, your head is out of the tunnel you're looking around at all these other things to find inspiration from you're not you're not just focused on everything inside this tunnel of uh, landscape photography but what was the what made you sort of look outside what made you um, look to other influences ah oh, that's yeah good question um, so as you said I remember when I first got in photography as I mentioned it shortly a minute ago that 
it just didn't even cross my mind to try anything but landscape photography because that's all that appealed to me. And it, I guess it got to the point after a couple of years where I felt like it was all starting to look the same when I'd view other work. It didn't mean that I didn't want to shoot landscapes, but um, I guess I just found that when I'd look at other photography styles, street photography, black and white portraits, whatever, I just found, yeah, it just naturally inspired me, but it didn't inspire me enough to warrant trying it. Mm. If anything, it just inspired me to keep getting out there and trying to refine my own craft. That's a really weird thing. I don't even know if that's common or not. Because uh, when I'd look at a landscape, I guess I'd feel like, oh, you know, there either was a competition was o- there, maybe. Yeah, was either it was overwhelmingly good that it depressed me, or <laughs> or I'd look at it and subconsciously critique it just because I'd be like, oh, if I was there, I would have tried to get lower. Not thinking I was better than them, but just like naturally. I'd put myself in that position because mm-hmm. I could relate to it. Yeah. But when I'd view other styles, it's like, man, I can't. This is so out of my league. Yeah. And maybe because I couldn't relate, there was more appealing and found it inspiring. Mm. But I feel like, yes, yeah, so there's so many benefits there because I'd learn from those styles and different genres and try and incorporate that into my own work, and kind of have an all-round skill set. Then instead of just purely focusing on landscapes, the rules yeah. of landscapes and only looking at landscapes for inspiration and really limiting where I can yeah. go with my work. So when you were in that well, that landscape tunnel, you were experiencing like this comparison. It's a dark place, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're experiencing, experiencing comparison to other landscape photos. You're experiencing being stuck to sort of conventions of landscape. But yeah. but now you've broadened your view, view and you, you kind of feel like you've broken out. You're more sort of free to experiment with like with yeah, your different... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 So that's, I suppose, our, our way to break the rule is to sort of break outside of your genre. You can still photograph what you love to photograph. I mean, but... Maybe it's good to take in influences from everywhere and yeah. try everything and and yeah, yeah just sing. don't just don't rule anything out too soon. Yeah. I guess would be the thing. Don't say oh, I'm getting into photography for to be A B C. Yep. Make sure you try that whole alphabet first. Swish it around and yeah. uh, <laughs> and then spit the the letters out that you don't like. <laughs> but in th- in saying that though, the positive I feel like I, we didn't touch on it enough at the start. The positive of maybe going down one direct road like I did initially is that all your time and energy is wholly fixed on that one style, one yep. genre, and you can excel much quicker. Obviously, so I feel like that's the positive, and you know that that can just short track a lot of stuff. Really, yeah. If you be focused and you work because hard maybe to that's your, all you're meant to yeah. do, and that's great, and that's awesome. And I feel like that's maybe what happened to me to a degree. I didn't waste a re- walk around trying street photography for six months and macro. Actually, I did do a bit of weird macro <laughs> stuff. <laughs> if you scroll back further enough on the Instagram, on the <laughs> iPhone, actually. But uh, yeah, so you can kind of short track and really just concentrate on what you feel like is your true yeah. passion. But, um, but, but you've got to step away from the yeah. comparison to other photographers. You've yeah. got to step away from the uh, the sort of rules of that genre, which might be holding you back. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I think. And just ha- trying to give yourself a defined look too soon um, is just going to close a lot of doors for you. And the reason Will and I wanted to talk about this tonight is because we were inspired uh, by a letter written by a renowned uh film uh, photojournalist and documentary photographer uh, from, I think, the Chile. 70s or 60s. Oh, yeah, yes, and he's, Chil- Chil- yeah, he's Chilean. Chilean yeah. And, yeah, just a really amazing photographer. His name's uh, Sergio Lorraine, which may be pronounced wrong. Sergio Lorraine. Just off- <laughs> <laughs> offensive it's at that most stage. Like, yeah, that's just completely <laughs> offensive. <laughs> and... Uh, in this one, he's he's writing a letter, essentially, and I'll, I'll give you the, the basics. Good photography comes when you are delivered from conventions, obligations, convenience, competition, and you are free. Like a child in his first discovery of reality, you walk around in surprise, seeing reality as it is for the first time. Yeah, we just found those words very inspiring. And uh, definitely uh, quite relatable in the... <laughs> 
<laughs> in this day and age. In this day and age. Sorry, I couldn't help it. T-shirts uh, on our t-shirts website soon. T-shirts coming soon in this day and age. <laughs> Old Mate. man Wilbur in this day and age. <laughs> We might, uh, yeah, we'll leave you there with those thoughts, guys. Thanks again for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye.